define yourself as somebody that is democratizing art. And I found that a very interesting um, way of describing one's journey and what one's goal and vision is in life. What does that mean to democratize art? Gosh, what a, a great question. What, what, what does it mean to you, David, when you hear democratizing art, what do you hear? Art for all, um, you know, the ability for each, that's it. I didn't expect you to come back at me. Um, the ability for everyone to be able to practice the beauty that's inside of them. Is that colorful enough? Yeah, beautiful. I think that's beautifully said. I love that. Every, be, people to be able to practice whatever is inside of them. I think that's, I think that's exactly right. And, and you know, my, my belief is that art is a fundamental human right and that uh, uh, by practicing creative expression and being part of, of, of communities that encourage and foster creative expression, uh, it, I mean, in, in, in every respect, lives are better and communities are better when we, when we do that, you know, in terms of developing empathy and uh, being a good listener and being a, 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 a a civically engaged citizen. Um, so, you know, beyond, I, I'm absolutely in support, for example, of the, the STEM to STEAM movement, right, in K-12 mm -hmm. education, which says science, technology, engineering, and math is great, but those students can only realize, those kids can only realize their full potential when arts are part of that equation. Of course, I believe that, but I also believe that some of this is very hard to measure uh, because it's not only or even primarily about a test score for a kid. It's about about it's about that kid or adult being able to 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 listen to to have and develop empathy to be interested in continual learning and improvement, uh, and and to being open to hearing and sharing new stories and ways of being. So uh, uh, so that's really for me what democratizing art is about. Wow, it's beautiful. When I was in San Diego. Uh, with the San Diego Performing Arts Center, we um, the city of San Diego shut down all the music and arts program in all their schools. Well, they're like, we can't afford this. Let's just keep it to the curriculum that we have to do by state law. And all music went, all art went, and they saw a decrease in grades versus a focused increase. And um, our Performing Arts Center started providing free first 12-week lessons to anyone that walked through the doors doing group lessons. So we'd have um, a room full of 12 keyboards, and then we'd have college volunteers come in and teach those keyboard lessons and flute lessons and, and drum lessons and vocal lessons, as well as dance and other things. And we would we were having at one point 2,000 students a week coming through, um, half of those part of these programs that we're running that were for free for all the beginners so that they could really touch that place of, you know, art, artistry on the inside. We found, just like you said, the parents are saying, when they got involved with music and art, their grades increased at school. And this is, it almost like opens up a part of the brain that allows a child's imagination to breathe and they're willing to, to grab a hold of those next, those next challenges in front of them. Well, and yes, and and when you think about the uh, the the workforce of the 21st and 22nd centuries, everything that's happening in technology, everything that's happening in in health and healthcare services, every everything that's happening in 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 any 21st and 22nd century industry, having uh, uh, having an ability uh, and and skill set around uh, creativity, around design thinking. Uh, though, uh, everyone, has, I think, has a general um, agreement that those sort of uh, creative thinking skills and creative doing skills are essential to having the kind of, not only workforce, but the kind of uh, populace, the kind of citizenry that, that will be not only effective workers, but, but effective empathic people. In, in our community. So I think there's not only a, a huge benefit long-term to uh, developing the kind of workforce that we want, but really the kind of, the kind of communities, the kind of citizenry that we want that, that uh, is, is rooted in creativity, is attuned to design, and is also uh, 
really uh, uh, under understands and and has practiced uh, empathy. That's beautiful. Um, I see in your your journey where you are now at the Washington course that has been a part of that engagement. And um, and before you stepped into the leading role at the Washington course. You've been in situations where an organization's had its back against the wall and you needed to step in and and help revitalize it. How do you approach a nonprofit that's in trouble? Sure. Well, um, there are so many things to say about that. The um, when whenever a leader steps into an organization, one of the first things we're doing is is listening and assessing, right? We're observing. We're watching, we're analyzing, we're, we're having conversations, most of which is about listening, asking good questions, collecting information, observing those things that perhaps are unsaid or unspoken, but that if you, if you take a real look around, you can observe uh, behaviors, activities, et cetera. Of course, it's looking at the balance sheet, looking at the financials, looking at the operating model, looking at the business model, looking at governance, looking at outcomes, it's, it's looking at the totality of that picture. And then it's about bringing people together around a shared understanding of what that picture is telling us. And so, so much of this is about, about effective framing and effective communication. Because um, uh, when, when you walk into an organization, uh, 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 certainly you bring your skill set and toolbox with you but you need to bring a lot of curiosity and you need to, you know, what we talk about in operations, you need to go to the Gemba. Uh, the Gemba is, is the place where the work happens. This is an operational term, but you need to go to the place where the work happens, you know, like in manufacturing. If you want to know what's happening in a plant, what do you do? You have to go to the floor. You have to go to the floor and see what's happening. If you're an organization that does direct services, you can not only talk to your board members and senior staff, you have to go to the field and see what's happening in the execution of those direct services and talk to those individuals who know so much about what's happening and, 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 and have such rich experiences uh, about what's working or not within the organization. And then you need to bring that picture, um, you need to be able to frame that, that picture effectively and then, and then uh, uh, convene all of your stakeholders around uh, a shared understanding of what that picture is telling you. And then you need to start executing. You need to prioritize and then start executing on, on what the improvement opportunities are. That's, that is, that's important to be able to define what works and what doesn't. And you said it really well, the ability to be able to take what does work and emphasize that and then be able to address the things that don't. And um, that type of uh, mentality to learn how to do that, often it comes from input coming into our lives as leaders, to be able to decipher what works, what doesn't, and be able to know what's taking place in current trends. Um, I, I, this is just a question off the, you know, off, off the set, basically. When you look at things that are impacting your life, the things that uh, that are um, educating you so that you can lead well, you know, books or influencers or, or coaches, or, what is it that's really impacting you and lifting you as a leader like yourself? That's such an important question because that, that you know, I, I'm such a firm believer in continual improvement and lifelong learning and... Uh, and so, uh, on the one hand, David, I want to say everything. What is not? <laughs> what's what's not impacting me right now? Because it, it, I can think of <clears throat> so many books and people and executive coach I have worked with, and and my therapist, and you know, I could. There's a whole long list of folks. Um, I currently, I'm I'm working on uh, an MBA, an executive MBA at the University of Virginia, Darden School of Business. And, and so to your question about what right now is, is really top of mind in terms of the, the, the inputs that are influencing me most germanely, it, it really is this educational experience and, and the quality of, of teaching and learning and the brilliant classmates that I have a chance to learn from and with at the University of Virginia Darden School of Business. This is 
a, a profoundly transformative experience for me and is has already changed so much about my knowledge, my worldview, uh, vastly expanded my toolkit uh, and and really challenged me to grow and and learn in ways that I didn't anticipate. So 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 many things about that. I, I'm in a, in a course right now about effectual, I'm in several classes right now, one of which is about effectual entrepreneurship. And so one of the things that's just top of mind to me today, David, is, is just the role of entrepreneurial thinking within a nonprofit organization context and how can we bring tools and frameworks and 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 ways of 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 thinking and doing entrepreneurially to our work as as nonprofit organizations in service to creating an even stronger community impact you remind me of um you know during my 20s and 30s i i was constantly in school while i was working and there was always something I didn't know. And I got a point in my mid forties where I know I'm aging myself now, which is, is terrible. Um, but I got a point in my mid forties where I was like, okay, I know what I, I, I need to know to be successful, what I'm doing. And, uh, and, but the, the hunger to learn was just there. So I found myself, we had a community college, literally a, uh, two blocks away from our home. And I'd sign up for one class a quarter and I just go in the class and here I am in a 40 year old, well-educated sitting in a room of a bunch of 19 year olds going through this particular course. And one that really impacted me was mathematical psychology. And it was taking um, theorems that um, you could put to any argument and prove mathematically if that argument was true or false. Even ones, uh, statements of faith, statements of politics, uh, sales statements, you could, or financial statements, you could turn around and take them, add it to an equation, and then come up with a false or true answer at the end of it. And it fascinated me, this course. It was complicated. It was amazing how many times I got invited to Starbucks to brainstorm with the students in that class saying, okay, Mr. Higgins, what is this supposed to do for us? I'm like, okay, so I was in a board meeting last week, and I took this theorem, and somebody brought a financial you know, thing in front of me, and I used this theorem. And I proved to them that their finances and their numbers were incorrect using this math, math, mathematical psychology. It blew my mind. And that was after I thought I knew what I needed to know, but we never get there, do we? We're always something more to learn. Yeah, always. I, I agree completely. There's always something to learn. And, and uh, uh, so, so much of what impacts what's happening in our organizations is are, are, is really the questions that we're asking, the questions that we're asking, and the data that we're looking at, and even what's behind that data that we're looking at, uh, and and we have to uh, constantly uh, uh, really challenge ourselves to be asking ever better questions to to make sure uh, that that we are not only uh, uh, rigorous in in our in our utilization. Of data to inform decisions, but 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 always uh, remembering that there are um, components that are exogenous to that data that are outside of that data that must be considered. Human components, uh, 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 environmental components, so many so many other elements. But I, as long as we're interested in con continual improvement, continual learning. And, and, and asking for the support that we need, which can be so difficult sometimes, but, but remembering to ask for the support that we need, then, uh, then, then we're really on the right path.